So the time has come for us to look at designing a proper deep neural network. We're going to have these two hidden layers and an output layer. And I'm going to show you how to design it and how to write the code. And I'm also going to move away from showing you the actual RPUBS document. We are here in R Studio, and we're going to look at the actual code. Now it's already all written as you can see here. And what I did to create it was just to say it's a new so on that little triangle there, are markdown. This is a markdown file. Now a markdown file is different from a script file. You see script there in that we have this rich environment. Most importantly, up here, very small, you can see this little tab that says knit. And if I click on that downward facing little arrow there, we see I can knit this file to an HTML. That is what we do to create an, a file or an HTML file to upload to our pubs or upload to the web. And I'll put the link in the description below of this exact document. You can also knit to a PDF and you can knit to Word. So it is a lovely environment from which you can create all sorts of documents. Now I want to show you the code, the R Studio coding environment itself, and then the deep learning. So there's a lot uh, to this video lecture. So it always starts off with, with these three little minus symbols and closed by those. Inside of these is a type of language, I suppose you can call it that, called YAML, Y-A-M-L, just another markup language. Now the web is built on HTML, hypertext markup language. That shows a web page how to display things together with uh, cascading style sheets. And mark, markup language, is, you could see that as a simplified form of HTML. And what we have here is some, a few things that are pretty standard. There's title, author, and then output. And you see the title. That will be the title that's displayed on the top bar of the website. It'll have the author listed. And then output, I'm specifying here that it must be HTML. So you know, I am going to knit it to HTML, but I'm specifying overriding that by saying this must be an HTML file. There must be a table of contents. And then the number sections is false. So it's not going to have number one, number two, number three to the different headings that I do have. All the code that you write go inside of these three little tick marks. On my keyboard, it's top left next to the number one key on the top row. And you have to have three of them and you close with three of them. And you can see that RStudio colors this in a different color. Mine is light gray, as we can see here. And the first line stipulates inside of these set of curly braces a few things. The first thing is states the language in which this piece of code called a chunk is written. And I'm specifying that it's written in R. You can give this chunk, this set piece of code inside of these little tick marks, a name. You needn't do that. This is done automatically. So this chunk was called setup. And if we look right down here, there's a little, tiny little piece of text there. If you click on it, you can see all your code chunks. And you can see their chunk one setup because it was named, but I didn't, I didn't uh, name all the other code chunks. But if you do name them, it's easy to navigate to those code chunks there. Include equals false. This means this is not going to be shown in the final HTML or PDF or Word document. This is also also set up automatically. You don't have to worry about it. There's some options here. The echo is set to true, which means that in all the other ones to follow, unless you say include is false, the code is actually going to show up. And I've introduced this set working directory to get working directory. So it's going to get the working directory where this actual R Studio file is saved, RMD file is saved, and it's going to take that address on my solid state drive of my computer and it's going to set that to the working the, the the working directory now here's another code chunk well before we get to that you have different ways to run this code chunk when you're inside of it you can click the run button up there or you can click this little run button right here and you'll see there's a brief little green stripe there and it will go from top to bottom as it executes the lines of code and it is now executed another way to execute that is to have your cursor somewhere inside blinking there and to hold down shift control and enter that's pc and mac uh, pc and linux i should say or shift command and return on a mac 
that will also, if you have that uh, key combination, it will also execute. So here's my second code chunk. And again, those three little tick marks, you can type them in. And I'll show you a keyboard shortcut for that a bit later. And again, open and closing curly braces. And I only have R in there just to show that this is R code. I haven't given it a name or specified anything else. And I'm going to import three libraries, Reader, Keras, and DT. But see that it's also enclosed in a separate function called suppress messages. If you import these libraries, it's going to give you a bit of information. Some of them contain functions that overwrite the base and core functions in R, and you'll get those little messages, but I don't want to see them on the screen, so I just say suppress messages, and then library, reader, keras, and dt. Reader is a package that helps to import a file such as spreadsheet files in a better way than the base, or an extended way than the base or core R can do. Keras, of course, is our deep learning neural network package, which is going to provide us with function and code to be able to design and run deep neural networks. It sits on top of TensorFlow, in my, in, in my case. And then the DT stands for data table. It is just a package that allows for you to create very beautiful, dynamic and interactive tables on a web page. Because I'm going to export this as RPUBs, I use DT just to do that for me. Now this piece of code here was also something that I introduced as a bit of cascading style sheet. And it just says that my heading one, heading two, and heading three should have different colors. It's that royal blue and then the orangey gold that I always use. This is also a line of text that I introduced. If you do this in this way, so we see the exclamation mark, the open and close square brackets, and then inside of parentheses, this is the name of the file that lives in the same folder directory as this file, which is a PNG file, and that is the image, the logo that you see on the RPUBS documents. So if you wanted to put your own logos in there or any other kind of image file, this is the way you go about it. Next up, we have two hashtags, pound signs. Hashtags, I think, uh, is what most people would know them as. So we have the two hashtags. That's markdown language, and that indicates that whatever is to follow must be in heading two size. So that, that gives you a nice heading to the paragraph that is to follow, and it's the introduction. And on the RPUBS file, or when you download this specific file from GitHub, you can read all about this what is coming in this in this uh, lecture. So let's start with the data. We're going to import a file. Uh, it's a CSV file, comma separated file. So it was opened up and created uh, in Microsoft Excel and just saved as a CSV file. It contains 50,000 observations, so 50,000 rows with 10 feature columns, so 10 feature variables, and then a, s a target variable that is binary. So it only has zero and ones in the sample space of that target variable. Remember the sample space are all the different elements from which the uh, the values that, that actually go into the target values. The data point values are chosen from a set and in this case it is nominal categorical and there's only a zero and a one. So I'm going to use the read underscore CSV function that's different from the read dot CSV that's the built-in core R function, read underscore CSV comes from the reader package and it creates what is called a tibble, which is different from a data frame and the data frame comes from the read dot CSV and there's slight differences between the two, most notably in the way that the data sheet is displayed, especially if you use an R script file, it just displays it differently on the screen in R Studio, making it uh, more manageable and there's subtle other differences which we needn't be concerned about now, you can read about some of them there. So here's our, our code again, tick marks, tick marks, curly braces with the R. And I'm going to create an object, a computer variable called data.set. That's my choice. Uh, that's what I use when I import files. You can use your own name. Just bear in mind that there shouldn't be illegal characters like spaces and leading numbers, etc. And again, my uh, assignment operator there. Now the assignment operator is easy to do. It is just Alt or Option and the minus key shortcut. So read underscore CSV and now the name of the file which is, would be available will be available on GitHub. 
simulated binary classification dataset.csv inside of quotation marks and I'm setting the call names argument to true because the data file does have its first row in, in the spreadsheet file is the column names. And then I'm using data table. Now data table is a function from the DT package and I'm going to pass to it what I want to be printed out that is data.set so I'm data.set I want that expressed as an HTML table on a website eventually and I'm using so remember what these square brackets are they are addressing for row so there's the row comma ooh, there's the comma actually comma column now you see the column is empty and if you leave it empty like that it means all of the columns so which rows do I want? There are 50,000 rows. I don't want all of them. So I'm just going to take a 1% sample, random sample of all the rows to put in my HTML uh, table here. So I'm going to specify the first argument in the sample function. Remember, this is all part of which rows to select, comma, which columns to select. So I'm going to use the sample. The first argument is the total number of rows to select from. And I'm using the number of rows in a row function and passing the data set object to that. Replace is false. So when a row is selected at random, it's not put back into the bowl to be reselected. So I'm saying that is false. And the size, the number of rows or samples that I want is 0.01 times the number of rows of the data set. So that's 1% of the data set. So that's a random selection, a random sample of all the rows showing all the columns and when we run this bit of code here we execute that oh, first we have to import it so that happens quite often when you do when you do um, this so we've got to go all the way back up and we didn't execute these lines of code so let's set the password let's import all of those libraries let's go down let's go down let's go down you see the little red there, it tried to execute and gives you an error. It says cannot find read underscore CSV because we did not import the reader uh, package yet. So now we do that, you see the green line, that's all done. And you can see a representation of what it is going to look like on the eventual HTML file. Very nice because you can select these variables and you can order them in descending or ascending order. You can search for specific values. Say for instance, these were some of these were names, nominal categorical variables. You can search for them and you can go previous and next and look at all these pages. Very nice way. Now I'm going to use the summary function and pass the data set to that. Let's just do that. And that's going to summarize all of the columns for us. And we see that the column names were var1, var2, var3, var4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And the last column, column 11, was named target. That's in this actual spreadsheet file. And we can see the descriptive statistics. Min, first quartile, median, mean, third quartile, max. And you can see all these values are, have a mean of around zero. So they like from a st standard normal distribution. This was a specially created data set, uh, which uh, makes the training of the neural network that we're going to create very easy. So it was designed specifically uh, for this with this lecture in mind. Now, we've imported this data, but it does not exist in a format that we can pass it into the neural network once we design the neural network. So we've got to prepare the data, and that's called pre-processing. And we've got to go through a few steps. The first step is to take this table, this data frame or this list, whatever you want to call it, and transform it into a mathematical matrix. Now remember, that's a type of tensor. And if you were to bring in images, so eventually we are going to bring in images as data that has to be transformed. And we're transforming this into a tensor. And in this instance, a matrix, because we're going to have rows and columns. Uh, of So that's going to be a rank two tensor. And so we change that into a rank two tensor or matrix using this as matrix function. So I'm going to recast the data set as a, as a matrix data set. So now it's not a table or data frame or list anymore, it's now a matrix. And then I'm going to discard all the column names so that I only have the numerical values. And for that I say dim names of the data set set that to null. So all I have is this rows and matrix of numbers. Now, if we had categorical names in there, like benign, malignant, whatever, we would have to change that into numbers, 
as well. But in this instance, in this simple first example, we have none of those worries. They're all numbers to start off with. You could see that they were all numerical. And all we're going to do is just change it into a matrix and remove the, the, the variable names, the column header. Now, the next very important concept to understand is the splitting of your data. Now, you've got to uh, split your data into two parts, a training set and a test set. Very important. You want to take some of the data out of the data set and, and keep it separate and call it a test set. Now, the test set must not be seen by, by the matrix. It must con contain some of the samples, some of the rows, that will never be seen during the training phase. So we've got this test set, uh, the training set, which makes up the majority, and we'll speak about how to split it and, and, and what size is used for the split in a moment. We are going to split it uh, so that the training set is what we actually pass to uh, the neural network. And from that, it's going to train and optimize its parameters by minimizing the cost function and this continuous process of forward and back propagation and the back propagation through gradient descent. We've talked about all these things. But then we, once it's all done, we want to pass new data to it that it's never seen before, data to which we know the answer. So it comes from this original data set in which the target is known. This is supervised machine learning, remember? And then it can test the accuracy for us. So we've got to do, we've got to do uh, this splitting of the data. By the way, uh, we see the three little tick marks. So we're coming up to an next bit of code. I just wanted to uh, tell you how to do this in a shortcut way. So instead of typing this, all you have to do is hold down Control, Alt, and I, the I key. That's PC and Linux. And on Mac, that will be Command. Uh, option I. So if I just do that, you see all of that was created in an instant and it's ready for me to write some code. So that short keyboard shortcut is very useful. It's highlighted and deleted. So what do we have here in this? I'm going to use the seed, the set.seed function. And that means every time this piece of code runs, it's going to generate the same random values for me in the same order because I'm going to generate some random values here. But setting the seed, and you can use any numerical value here. I've just used 1, 2, 3. You can just use 1, or 1, 2, 3, 4, or, f or 10, or 15. It doesn't matter. But it just means that every time this code is run, it'll follow a little recipe during the pseudo random number generation. And every time we run this code, we'll get exactly the same values out. So I'm going to call it, uh, create an object called INDX, short for index. And I'm going to use the sample function that we've seen before. The first argument is 2. Now, what happens here, it creates a little list. It starts at 1, and it counts up in whole numbers, so in integer values, to wherever you want it to stop. So in this instance, I'm going to have a sample space of just two values, 1 and 2. And the next argument stipulates how many of these I want. And I want that to be equal to the number of rows in my data set. Replacement is 2. So at random, it's going to pick a 1. But now, now there's only two left in the bowl, the number two left in the bowl. So next time I can only pick two, so I can only have two random values. But what it does is it, it imagine there's a little piece of, a little card in a bowl, and they both of them, one's got a one, one's got a two written on it. They fold it, you put your hand in, eyes closed, wriggle them around, take out one at random. You see what it is, you know, jot it down, and you put it back in the bowl. That's what the replacement is. So that means I can do this thousands of times over, and I'll get one, one, two, two, one, two, one, two, whatever. So replace is true. And I'm also setting a probability in the same order in which these two numbers came. Because we used shorthand, we just wrote the one number. But remember, there's a one and a two. I'm going to set the one to be chosen with a probability of 90% and 10% for choosing the second one, which is a two. So very imbalanced here. 90%, 10% at random. So there's going to be many more ones than there are twos. Remember, this has got a sum to one. So we're going to run that. 50,000 times. Let's run that 50,000 times. So I've got this long list now of ones and twos, of which there are many more ones, and they are equal to exactly the number of rows in my data set. So that's great because now we can actually use this to split our data. Now there's many ways in R to split the data. So this is just one way. It's, it's a little bit laborious, but let's have a look at it. I'm going to create two objects now called ones called Xtrain and Xtest. Now, it's customary in machine learning to use X for your matrix of features. So that does not now contain the target, the column vector of the, the target variable. If you, if, you, if you draw out only the features, 
we usually call that X. And I want two, I want a training set and a test set. And what I want to do is to assign to that the original data set, and then I'm going to use square brackets. That means I'm going to do row, comma, column indexing, addressing. So the rows, I want where index equals one. So this is very compact code. So it's going to, it's got this index, one, one, two, one, 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 two, one, 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 two, one, two, one, one, go through all of those, all 50,000, and wherever it's one, it is going to use that for the row. So it's going to select all the 90% of the original rows. It's going to draw them out, and the columns I want is only columns one through 10. Those are the 10 feature variables. So remember, there were 11 columns, so 11 is the target one. I don't want that. And the, the test set is then where the index is two, which is only comprises 10% of the data, and also just those. So I'm creating these two, I am creating these two matrices, a train one and a test one, I should call them two tensors. So that takes care of splitting the data as far as the features are concerned. We need to do exactly the same thing for the target and we better have them stay exactly the same. So the same ones stay with the train and the same ones stay with the test. Otherwise, we may mix them up. This makes no sense whatsoever. There's one little side track I have to go down because later on, I want, uh, when we do the testing, I want a separate object and I'm going to call mine Y test actual. And I just want to save that separately because remember that is what we're going to test against. That is our ground truth. So I'm going to take data.set where the index is 2, so that means it's going to be equal to this x test, and column 11. So I'm just going to store that separately. I always do that um, right in the beginning just to keep them separately. Okay, we're almost there. We still need a bit of pre-processing. The last bit we're going to do is something called one-hot encoding. Now, one-hot encoding is something that we use quite often. And it changes a single data point value into a lot of dummy variables. So remember my target. My target variable consisted only of 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. But I want to create, because there are only two to choose from, my sample space is two, I'm going to create two dummy variables. And they're always called 1 and 2. If they're 3, they'll call, be called one, oh, 0, 1 and 2. If they're 4, they'll be 0, 1, 2, 3. Doesn't matter. So one, one, would one of these, the zero, would represent one of the elements in my sample space, and the other one would represent the second. So imagine I didn't have zero and ones, but I had benign and malignant. There are two in my sample space, so imagine my target just said benign, malignant, benign, malignant. One hot encoding means I'm going to form two dummy variables called zero and one, and the zero will be benign, and the one will be malignant. So now I have two columns in my target variable, a zero and a one. And if that specific one says benign, I'm going to mark a one in the zero column and a zero in the one column. Makes sense. One hot encoding. So only one of those possible ones will have a one under it. And if the one is under benign, which was zero, that means that was benign. And if the one is under malignant, and all the others, the zero in this instance, have a zero under it, it means that was malignant. So let's, have, let's, let's do that. And there's a Keras function called too categorical that will do for that for me uh, automatically. So pay attention. I'm going to create two s objects called y train and y test, y underscore train, y underscore test. And I'm going to use the two categorical function. I'm going to pass my data set and again use addressing. So index is one and index is two and only column 11. Let's run that and let me show you what it looks like. The noise outside is obviously tremendous. Again, apologies for that. I mentioned in the other videos, it's the neuroscience center built right outside my office window here. Unfortunately, nothing I can do about it. I'm going to open the environment tab up above, which we haven't, which was not open initially. And all the objects, computer variables that we've created are listed here. So we've just created white train and white test. Let's have a look at them. I'm going to show you white test. Let's open it up by hitting that little button. We see this opens up here. Now look at it. Instead of there being a single zero and one zero and one, we have these two variables. And 
The first one was a zero and the second one was a one. It's the one that has the one under it. So this means this first one was a one. You can see the second one was a one. Third one was a one. Fourth one was a one. Fifth one was a one. Sixth one was a one. And that's the one hot encoding. So if you had more, because your sample space was bigger, only one of them would have a one under it. One hot encoding. Right, let's carry on. Uh, let me do this bit of code. I'm going to use the cbind function that's going to combine whatever I give the, these. These are vectors. Those are r vectors. And I separate them by a comma. So it's just going to combine all of these as columns. Let me show you. So there we have. The first one is called y test actual 1 to 10. So these were the actual values. Remember I saved that separately. So my test set, the actual target were 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0 for the first 10. And now I'm passing y test, which was one hot encoded, as the next two columns. So you see column 2 and column 3. So because this was a 1, the one hot encoding gives me 0, 1. And when it's a 0, the one hot encoding gives me 1, 0. It's the 1 under the 0 column. And therefore, the actual one was a 0. So I think you get what one hot encoding is all about. So we, we are doing that in this instance. Now, strictly speaking, you can have a sigmoid function, an activation function. I'm going off on a tangent here, but bear with me. You can put in a sigmoid function in your last, in your output node, but we're going to do something different here. And I do that on purpose because in many instances, our sample space is going to be more than just two. That, that would be quite common. And it's good to get used to this one hot encoding and having a different activation function for our last couple of nodes and not only to have a single node. It's a sidetrack. Uh, you'll, you'll get you'll better appreciate it as this course continues. Now, very, very exciting. Let's create our first model using Keras and TensorFlow. I'm going to skip all of those that written word. And here we are in this chunk of code. We're going to create a model. First of all, we're going to give it a name. So our object's called model, just model. And I'm going to say that this is a special kind of object. Remember when we created functions, we started off by saying object and then assign to that a function. And then in parentheses, what the arguments are, and then inside of curly braces, what the function actually does. Similar sort of thing here. I'm going to specify that this object is a Keras underscore model underscore sequential, a sequential model using Keras. Inbuilt function in Keras. There are two ways that you can create deep neural networks in Keras. One is the sequential model, which we use quite often, and the other one is a functional API, which allows for very intricate modern type of neural networks uh, to be designed, and we'll get to that in a future lecture. So I'm just instantiating this object and call it model and it is a sequential Keras model. Now you're going to see something new. This is a pipe symbol. So it's a percentage greater than percentage and all it does is shorthand. It takes a function. So the function is actually called layer underscore dense, which is part of Keras. And it takes whatever is on the left hand side of this pipe symbol, which is model, and it passes it as a first argument. So right there with a comma. So it's actually layer dense, comma, name, etc. But what the pipe does is it allows for you to embed things. So you'll see another pipe there and another pipe. So this model goes as a first argument there. This whole thing from there to there goes as first argument right in there. And then all of this goes as first argument in there. So it's this layer upon layer upon layer. It's a very nice uh, part of R. It's actually part of what is called the tidyverse, and we might have time to discuss this, that later. But it's a very nice design so that you can still set out things like this, but just like telescope it, but pull it out so one thing fits inside of the other thing. Don't worry too much about that. So we're going to say model and pass that to the first layer, the layer underscore dense. It's a function in Keras, and it says that this first layer is a dense layer, a densely connected layer. I'm just going to move down. Oh, we'll have to look at that separately. Uh, we're going to just do the dense layer. The first argument is a very optional argument. I'm giving it a name, deep layer one. See, there are no spaces there. That would be illegal. So I'm just going to give it a name. You do not have to give it a name. This is just 
for completeness sake. I'm stating that the first hidden layer must have 10 nodes. Remember I had 10 feature variables, so I'm going to use 10 nodes. It's up to you. That's a, what is called a hyperparameter. A hyperparameter is something that you decide on during the design of your network. I have just decided that my first hidden layer must have 10 nodes. Up to you. The activation function, you've seen this one before, I want that to be a rectified linear unit. And for your first dense layer, you have to stipulate the input shape because it doesn't know what data you are going to pass to it after the design phase. And you need to stipulate the dimensions of this incoming vector, which remember is each row vector, the samples, one row after the other that you're going to pass into this network. And because there were 10 variables, I'm passing the number 10 to it. This refers to the number of variables, feature variables in my data. And it is because we're going to do uh, behind the scenes, remember forward propagation is the inner product between two tensors and those dimensions have to be correct. Otherwise that inner product, that tensor multiplication cannot happen. It's a type of mathematics, remember linear algebra and it cannot happen if the dimensions are not proper. So I've got to stipulate that. Now all of that gets passed into a next layer, another densely connected layer, hence I use the layer.dense name I'm going to call it deep layer 2. Needn't do that. Again, 10 units. Again, the rectified linear unit activation function. This time, though, the size of the dimensions of what gets passed need not be stipulated. It would be inferred from what is coming in. So from that 10 and this 10, it can infer what the dimension should be. You needn't do that. You needn't worry about that for subsequent layers. Then another dense layer, and this is going to be my output layer. It's going to have two nodes, and the activation function is not sigmoid, it is softmax. Now, in the future, we are going to discuss these, including softmax. Softmax is a very special kind of activation function. What it does, it takes the number of units that you have, the number of nodes in the layer, and it will, after activation, provide a probability for the value in the first node and the value in the second node, such that the probabilities add up to one. And you can see where this is going. Because we have, we must predict either a one or two, it is going to have a probability for the number one node and a probability for the number two node. And similar to what we did with a one hot encoding, what it's then going to do is going to take which node, the zero or the one, had the highest probability, and that will become the predicted output. Lastly, I'm going to call summary of the model. Let's do that, run that, and it will give me a little summary of the model. Now, how does this work? It gives the layer and its type. And because I called it deep layer one and deep layer two and output layer, we're actually going to see those names there. If you didn't put the name, there'll be something generic there. It says the type, both of these are densely connected layers, so all the nodes are connected to each other. The output shape is going to be these column vectors of size 10, 10, and 2. And we specified that with a number of nodes. And the number of parameters that it has to learn through continuous backpropagation, forward propagation, backpropagation, forward propagation, backpropagation, like backpropagation um, using gradient descent to uh, minimize the cost function until we have optimum values. It says how many parameters there are in each layer. Now, how did it get to 110? That's very easy. Remember, I had 10 in my input, so there were 10 nodes in my input, and the first one had 10 in it. The first hidden layer had 10 units in it. So if each one is connected to each one, that's 10 times 10, that's 100. And remember, each of the 10 in the first hidden must also get input from its own biased value. And that biased value must also have a size of 10. There must also be 10 of them. So 100 plus 10 is 110. Same for that 110. And the last one, remember, there are two, 10 nodes connected to two. So each of the 10 has two connections to it. So 10 times two is 20. But that two also has input from, bio, from a bias node. So that's two extra, giving you 22. That means I have a cost function that is a multivariable function with 242 unknowns. Now remember from school, y equals x squared. The x, that's a single unknown. I now have an equation with 242 unknowns which I have to optimize through partial differential equations, just through taking partial derivatives, I should say.
So that is beautiful. You can see it coming together. It is so nice. Now I've got a little image there. That's what I wanted to show you, but I've forgot that you don't actually see it here before we knit it. So I'll sh show you what that looks like. Now that my network is created, I have to compile it. Now I'm going to introduce a few new things here, which we're not going to cover. So just have a look at them and we'll discuss them later. So the compiling of the model says, again with a pipe, use the compile function. So the first argument is going to be model, but I don't do that. We use this pipe. And then I've got to specify a loss function, an optimizer and a metric. Now the loss function, instead of mean squared error, we're going to use categorical cross ent entropy. We're going to discuss what that is and how that differs from mean square in the future. Just take my word for it. This is a better loss function. The gradient descent is going to be done in a specific way which is different from the very generic ways that I showed you before. And it's going to use an ADAM, what is called ADAM, an ADAM optimizer for this gradient descent. Stochastic gradient descent is another famous one. And the metric we want to use is accuracy. So our measure of wo how well the model is training is going to be accuracy. So we've created our model and we've compiled our model. Let's fit the data to it. And to fit the data, there's going to be a few other things in here, which we'll discuss later. And anyway, I'm going to call this fitting. I'm going to give that a name uh, object, create an object called history. And it's going to take the model and pass it as first argument to the fit function, the fit also part of Keras. In the fit function, then the model is passed as first argument through this pipeline pipe symbol. I'm going to pass X train and Y train to it. So X train is my matrix of feature variables and Y train is my matrix of target values, which is one hot encoded now, remember. Epochs, we've discussed epochs before. That is how many times we're going to have full forward, a step of full forward propagation and back propagation. So going through all the data once forward with all the tensor multiplications and additions of of um, the bias values and then activation functions creating the uh, value and then creating a loss so the prediction and then a loss so all that and then back propagating through gradient descent through the derivatives and updating all of our weights our parameters so that full ones going through the network once and coming back through back propagate propagation that's one epoch and i want 10 epochs i wanted to run back and forth 10 times because i know every time i should have better 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 parameters the batch size is something new what the batch size is is don't run through all the forty-five thousand samples in one go do it in small little pieces and then update and small little pieces and update and small little pieces. And I'm going to set it to 256. By the way, if you're using a GPU for your training, which we're not going to use here on this machine, although I do have a GPU, I've only installed the CPU version of TensorFlow in Keras, make it a power of two. So two to the power four, two to the power five, two to the power six, two to the power seven. So I have 256 here. It just is just a, a, a good way for it's for memory to work in these size batches if you if you use powers of two. That's also all of these are hyperparameters. So my ten epoch size of ten, my batch size of ten, uh, two fifty six, my mini batch size for which the argument is only batch size, not mini batch size, but this is actually referred to as a mini batch. These are hyperparameters that I set. Now here's another thing that's new: a validation split. As we split the data into a training and test it initially, I'm also splitting the training set within the learning process. That allows for this network to have this special little set held separately, so 10% of the training set, and test itself all the time so that we can view it and see that it's actually doing well. It's obviously going to do well on the training set because it's, it, it knows what the answers are and it's doing that forward propagation, back propagation. But now I'm giving it data that it hasn't seen inside of this training phase, which is called the validation split, just to test itself. And you want that to also come down. If that doesn't come down, it means something, again, something that we're going to discuss in future, that it is not generalizing well. It is learning the data too well and it's it's memorizing your data and if it memorizes the actual data the training data it would not generalize to unseen data that well 
points that we'll really discuss in depth in future videos. And then there's this verbose argument. It just tells uh, it just tells what to show on screen as this runs. So let's do our first training. Whoop, there we go. And we see a few things happen on screen. So even though there's 45,000 rows of data to go through in batches of 256, forward and backwards, we see on even on a CPU, now this is a Core i7 CPU on this laptop, a rather high end, so it's, it's uh, not too shabby and it's running quite fast. Um, you'll see a little bit of nonsense up here saying that the TensorFlow binary was not compiled using some of the features in this specific Core i7. You're always going to see that. You can just ignore that. But it does stipulate that we're using the CPU here. And they ran through the first epoch, the second epoch, up to the 10 epoch. It'll tell you how long it took. The first run took a second, the second, and then it was a fraction of a second run through the other epochs. If I run this through a GPU, it'll be much, much faster. It said on a drain through 40,000, remember there was a validation set of 4,512 samples kept out. Now let's see what happened during the first epoch. It had a loss of 0.7 and an accuracy of only 59%. And of the validation set, it had a loss of 0.47, but quite a good um, accuracy. Now remember the accuracy is the correct predictions. It's the correct predictions divided by the total number of 83%. And now it went back through back propagation. It had better values to start off with for these weights. Now something we didn't discuss, the first time it runs through, there are random values. All those parameters, 242, were given random values to run through the first time. Somewhere on that multidimensional curve, we start off at some point. It was just totally random. But now at through gradient descent, it got to better values. So the second epoch was run, the loss fell dramatically for the training set. The accuracy went up to almost 91%. The validation went, uh, the error dram dramatically decreased as well, and the accuracy went up. And you can see as we go along, as we go along, as we go along, it gets better. You might have also noticed this beautiful graph that RStudio provides for us. And th this is really great. And one of the reasons why I love RStudio as opposed to just running this uh, in, in a Jupyter notebook and using Python is that this was a dynamic thing that happened. And you can see the the two, the validation is in green and the training set is in blue. And you can see as the epochs were running, the error got lower and lower and lower. And the, the uh, accuracy got higher and higher and higher. And what you see, something, very, uh, something that we'll get into is these two are very close to each other. So it is generalizing quite well. The training is not only specific to the training set, which will always get better, always get better here at the bottom, the loss will always go down, the accuracy will always go up. But in tandem with that, the validation set, which it just uses to measure all the time, also gets better. That means it is generalizing well to data it has not seen before. So that is a very good mark. Now, this is a toy data set, simulator data that I designed specifically to, for it to do this. This is not, not what you're going to see in the real world. And we'll certainly do some more real world examples in the future and you'll see these two being quite far apart and that's bad. And you'll see what we call it, what the problem is and what to do with it, how, how to change the design of your deep neural network to combat those problems. I'm just going to use the plot function and it's going to create some nice little plot here. It's a GG2, a GG plot type of plot that we can see of the loss and the accuracy in case you wanted to save that and, and uh, use that in a publication. So let's evaluate our model. Now I'm going to use the evaluate function and now data that it hasn't seen at all. It's not the spe special um, validation set that it kept out during the training phase. It's the actual data that it has never, ever, ever seen. X test and Y test. I'm going to pass that to the model. And this is where the tar, the tire hits the tar, what, whatever that saying is. So it says, of the data that it's never seen before, the loss was 0.158 and the accuracy was almost 96%. Not too bad. We can improve it though. There would be ways to get to, to change the design to get even better. But that's not too bad for data that it's never seen. It was 96% accurate. Now, you're not going to get to 100%. During, when I designed this 50, these 50,000 rows, it was designed so that there's a bit of overlap. Uh, and that is what happens in the real world. You're going to have variables and for 
the similar variables, you're going to get a different target value or, or, or the other way around. And that's real life. And it's because the variables that we gather are not always representative of what the real causes are. The target is not caused by the variables that you have in there. And that's a fundamental problem, which is very difficult, specifically in healthcare, in that the variables, the, the, the data point values for variables that we do collect is not necessarily the ones that determine the outcome, the target. Or they might be surrogates of a deeper lying physiological process that we don't understand yet and we can't collect data on that. And that's the true determinant of the outcome, the target value. And that is a real world problem. That's a, a problem that we deal with in normal statistics and here in machine learning. Are the variables the actual ones that that, 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 that cause the actual outcome. That's a deep, uh, a deep um, debate that we can have there. But let's carry on here. I'm going to do something else called create a object called predict. And now we're going to do the predict classes function and we pass X to it. So it's only given, going to give us the prediction of the test. Is it predicting a one or zero, one or zero? And I'm going to pass that to a table. And my table is going to have two rows and two columns, and I'm going to call the the top part predict and the, ac and the bottom actual. Let me, let me run that and show you what it does. It's called a confusion matrix. So the actual goes on the top, that's the second one, and predicted goes on the left hand side here. So it says if the actual value was zero, remember that comes from this y actual, it was predicted as a zero in 2,424 cases, and if the actual was a one, it was predicted as a one, and that's what this predict class is, is going to give me, just this long list of 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. If it was actually a one, it was right in 2250, but if the actual was zero, in 34 cases it was predicted as a one, and in 173 cases where it was actually a one, the prediction came out to be a zero. This is called a confusion matrix, and it also helps us to determine, you know, it's a visual way of seeing how, how good this test data was managed by this network that was trained. Another function that you could use is the predict proba, and I'm going to save that in a computer variable called prob, because what I want to show you is what happens. The predict proba is going to give me the prediction of, in this instance, only be because we have a 0 and a 1, remember through the one hot encoding, it's only going to give me the probability of this first one, the 0. But because we've set it up, we're actually interested in the ones. So I'm just going to subtract them from one. So the, the prediction of the first one, the zero, is going to be subtracted from one. That gives me the probability of the second one, the one. So if I run that and I do the first five, you can actually see what the probabilities were, was in my one hot encoding, my second node in the output, the one in actual fact. So it was 99%, 99.99%, 56%. That was a close call. So it just shows me this first five, what the actual value was in node number two. And that's what the softmax function did. It gave a probability for the second node and the first node. And I'm only looking at the probability that was outputted from the second node through the softmax function. And what actually happens for us to get either zero or one, there'll be this cutoff of 0.5. If it's 0.5 or higher, the final of, of this, the final prediction would be a one. If it's less than 0.5, the final prediction would be a zero. Now, <clears throat> let's do that through C bind, so you can actually see what happens. So I'm passing one minus prob, so that was the probability in the second node. And then I'm passing the predicted value based on that for rows one to 10, and then the actual one, which I saved right in the beginning. So we see that the second node was the highest at 99%, therefore the prediction was one, and that was quite correct because the actual value was one. So you can see how this all comes together. And that's it for this uh, very long lecture. I hope it was as exciting for you as it is for me. Deep, deep neural networks and the design of it using KRS on top of Tensor, TensorFlow here and R is just, is just such a wonderful, exciting thing to do. It, it really is just such a pleasure and I'm, I really hope that you are as excited as I am. So download this file from GitHub. Watch, uh, look at it uh, on R pubs and in R pubs you're actually going to see what it looks like. Let me do that for you. So let's save everything we've gone through. And now I'm going to knit. So I'm going to knit to HTML. Let's go. 
I'm going to warn you if you use the the if you use the GPU version of TensorFlow and Keras, you're going to run into problems at times when you do this knitting. It might not work properly for you. If you use the CPU version, it does. And here on the right hand side, we see the viewer. This is what we now can publish to our pubs. And I've already published it, so it's going to say republish. But this is what the document looks like. All the web elements done very nicely. We see what we typed. There's this very nice column thing. We can look at page number two, page number three, page number four. Very nice uh, widget there. We see the summary there. We see the, the colors of the different headings that I did in the cascading style sheet initially. And I just wanted to scroll down actually and just show you, uh, I'll give you a visual indication of that network. This is the network that we created in visual form. So I have my 10 input nodes and they densely connected. So they connected, each one is connected to each of the other ones. And that's why you get the 100 weights here, but there's a bias node as well. So after this tensor multiplication, we're going to add this column vector of bias node values. So there's another 10 giving me 110 weights there, uh, 110 parameters of which 100 are weights and 10 are biases. And another 110 here and then the 22 there giving me the final output of these two corresponding to the one hot encoding. So whichever one through the softmax gets the highest probability, that's going to be the final predicted value. I'll speak to you in the next video lecture.